Ten, the floor is yours. Hi, guys. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Uh, hello again. Uh, in today's presentation, I want to reiterate um, the speech we gave on uh, conference in Poznan. Uh, I mean, it's the same conference we gave a few years ago, but we try to refresh it and just keep it up to date with uh, our updates. And uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about Roadrunner, how we came up with this idea, how uh, it was implemented, and what are the implications for the stack. So to start, let me introduce myself. My name is Anton. I'm the CTO and so founder of the Spiral Scout, more than a decade, almost two um, uh, experience like doing projects for enterprise, small, large businesses, and so on. Uh, my main stacks right now is PHP and Golang, a few other languages which I'm typically trying not to mention. And uh, in addition to that, I'm the original is the author of the Roadrunner, though I don't think much left after uh, Valeri picked up the work, uh, and a few other open source instruments as well. So uh, what we're going to be talking today is a uh, few things. I mean, uh, first, let's try to kind of dive uh, in into the past, uh, at least past for us, uh, and uh, take a look how most of the PHP applications used to work, and I think still work. Um, see what are the optimization practices can be used to speed them up. Uh, and then we can dive into the more interesting topics in how Roadrunner actually implements these type of patterns and how they can be helping uh, your project and your stack. So to start, uh, classic PHP application lifecycle, something which we've been using for more than 20 years so far. And uh, to describe it, we can try to take a look at the application as a simple block diagram. So um, if you'll take a look at our application, we typically have uh, some uh, entry point, which calls our index PHP or something like that. It loads uh, Composer, it loads some libraries, load frameworks, uh, then it loads your domain code, controllers, routing, so on and so on and so on. So basically you're doing the request, you load a bunch of these things, and then you execute them uh, to provide output for the user. Uh, this approach is simple. Uh, very straightforward. You essentially create application within the environment of the HTTP request. Uh, frameworks, I mean, every framework supports this model. Uh, it's a single threaded model, so it's not that complicated in terms of like how to manage it from the memory control perspective and etc. Uh, and it dies after the every request. So the first thing which people start doing a while back ago, and uh, there's been actually a very big hit in PHP, maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, they started using lo lazy loading. So instead of loading essentially every needed file, uh, we can start loading files uh, as we go. So like if you don't need this particular piece of code or library for this particular controller, let's, let's not even touch it. Uh, this, ex uh, this especially became much easier to use when Composer came in because Composer allowed you to um, essentially uh, don't even require files anymore. You can just use uh, auto loading of classes. And this approach is really, very well optimized using opcache because once you load the file or, or the class, uh, next time you can fetch it pretty quick. Uh, this approach is typically not enough. Honestly, if your application is massive, you have hundreds of controllers, classes, domain layers, databases, and etc., uh, you have to jump to the second uh, kind of very much used approach, and this is start caching everything which you can possibly touch. So this is pretty much how Symfony work, um, and uh, Symfony will try to cache everything. It will try to cache your, con your container DI map, it will try to cache your routing pathers, uh, your templates, I mean, everyone caches templates, your ORM schema, and so on and so on and so on. So basically, if, if something works slow, just slap cache on top of that and hopefully it will be speed, uh, sped up. Um, you can find actually uh, pieces of this code pretty much in every library, especially in Symfony. It's like if you'll open, let's say, translator uh, bundle and translator file, even inside the translator service itself, you'll find the code which is generating uh, PHP cache to speed up the load. And so it kind of it kind of like the thing which grows in every part of your project. Uh, it, it is making the code much more complex, but it also gives you benefits of speeding up the application uh, bootstrap. So when we call this application, when we're trying to execute something, uh, we do it uh, well in a fairly linear way. We have an entry point, and in PHP, the entry point for the classic application is basically your environment. You'll find a post, get global variables, you'll find some heroes in a server. I mean, they're going to be kind of 
everywhere like some are going to be there some are going to be in other places but uh for your purposes it's basically your environment you launch application which leaves only for single purpose to self to serve the response for the one single request again this approach is very simple to implement well that's why php is pretty much everywhere but else it's not very cost effective because uh because your environment, while being locked for the single request, can't do anything else beside the single request. So you have to destroy the whole process, the whole framework, and kind of start over again. Um, if you deploy your application on production, uh, you probably have set up which is similar like this. Uh, some pieces can be replaced, like you might replace Nginx with Apache, Kadi, Light HTTP. There is many, many different web servers. Pretty much every server supports uh, PHP runtime. You might not use PHP FPM. You might use uh, mod PHP from Apache, but mostly most likely typical setup is going to look like that you have an ingress uh, nginx server which is handling your static connections your proxy into other services and etc and when the pitch uh, when the nginx matches the request which looks like the request going into your application it is sending a fussy gui request to PHP FPM, which is doing the rest. And the rest meaning it will create a PHP fork, uh, it will create an like, environment for this PHP fork within this request, execute it, and then kill it. So that's the typical setup. I would, uh, I probably guess that like 70% of internet, maybe less, uh, considering the result of WordPress work this way. So we know this approach kind of works. It's, it's hard to say that it doesn't. Um, so, what can we do to actually make it faster, uh, assuming that uh, we have this massive uh, overhead uh, launching the PHP fork every time and destroying it after? So first, what we can do, we can look at the things which language provide to us uh, out of the box. So obviously, you have to use opcache. If you run PHP on production if you, and you don't use opcache, there is no excuses for you. You're a bad person. Uh, use it. Um, you can use some of the newer instruments uh, like to speed up the process. You can use preloading. So preloading, essentially what it's going to do is going to read some of your PHP files and try to keep them in memory ready when your process starts. So it's like opcache on steroids. It cannot keep the runtime code running, only like... Uh, kind of classes, maybe some configs, so you still have to initiate your containers and etc. Uh, and so on. You can also use JIT. Um, JIT has some mixed reviews. In some cases it helps, in some cases it doesn't. It probably won't help you to make your ORM working uh, faster, but it will help you cranking, uh, crunching a lot of numbers. So JIT is a nice addition to, and uh, it's already available from, I think, version 8. Um, you can just say, hey, I mean, we hate PHP for some reason. Let's just move somewhere else. And there is options too. So some of the options just use runtimes uh, from Facebook, from Kontakte. There is things we just transcode your PHP code to .NET. Uh, I'm, I never met a person who actually did that in production, but I assume if the tool exists, someone does. So that's an instrument. Uh, or you can just say, let's rewrite this whole project which we spent 20 years building in different stack. Good luck doing that, but still, it is a valuable approach. Um, try it. Uh, or you can actually take a look uh, at the PHP lifecycle in general. And to, instead of trying to win these little bits by adding caching, by adding lazy load and op caching, you can try to think uh, what you can change entirely to make your process work faster. And the big elephant in a room, no pun intended, is the fact that PHP uh, till this moment, or like till 2019, maybe earlier, uh, typically was not used for the long running applications. And the long running applications is something which I'm going to talk in the next slides, obviously, but I want to mention here is something which actually can completely eliminate the whole need from you for you even using opcache, for using any caching approaches. And this approach will allow you to use PHP as pretty much any other language when your application sits in operating memory, which was specifically designed and optimized for that. So to do that, you have to do the very scary thing uh, and you have to diamondize your application or you have to make your application long running, uh, which is a probably less um, cursed term, let's say. Um, 
And you're doing that by pretty much applying the same principles which exists uh, on the market for the last 60 years in every other language. What you do, you essentially move the entry point or the moment when your application start processing the request from outside the environment. So it does, it is no longer depend on like, hey, we have this global pause and get variables on headers in the server. And you move it inside your application. And while moving the application inside, uh, what you'll notice that you essentially can split your whole application lifecycle into two very different uh, portions of the work. So portion number one, which is what you've seen uh, from initialization and cache warm-up, uh, you can call this portion bootstrap. That's the moment where you load all of your configuration files, schemas, templates, like classes, initiate the services, and etc. Uh, and uh, in alternative, you move all of your like real logic, or runtime logic, uh, which is doing actual payloads and requests, deep inside the application, inside what is called main loop. So you create a like while true loop essentially you get request you process and you push it out if you ever work with like uh, cron controllers or queue controllers you already seen this approach uh, being utilized in php for ages uh what people didn't do that they didn't haven't been utilizing that um like mostly for http which we did and we're going to show how uh so this approach um and this approach has one large benefit and one large effect for your application. Because your application now split into two in, like, very distinguishable parts, the first part, which is bootstrapping, is essentially free for you. You no longer care about time which takes to do the reflection of your code, reading all the attributes, loading all the configurations. You can pretty much drop the whole concept of lazy loading altogether, all the concept of caching altogether. Like if even if you're bootstrapping, and we actually do that in practice, in a bootstrapping phase, we can scan all of your project files, and based on these project files, we can scan all of the attributes, and based on these attributes, we can build like execution map. Uh, even if this process is going to take you one second, five seconds, uh, you won't notice because you're only going to do it once. And what you will notice is that most of your optimization practices are going to be revolving inside this main loop, inside running the request, picking the controller, doing something in servers, and so on and so on and so on. So like you're doing initialization just once and then infinite amount of requests unless uh, your code has memory leaks. If you'll try to compare this approach to the classic one, uh, you'll find a very interesting uh, kind of semi-paradox. So approach on the right, which is classic, is the approach which is very well optimized to execute a single request. Uh, so essentially the first request you will send to your application built on the classic approach you will work most likely faster, in some cases like twice faster than um, application with diamondized approach. However, the things uh, the thing are going to be changing a lot once you're going to be sending the second request because your typical application, classical one, won't be sped up. It will pretty much going to be on the same, uh, like maybe a little bit faster because of the op cache than the first request. But in diamondized OMAN, you're going to see like 10 times, 20 times improvement because you no longer have to do this boring work. You just have to like keep spinning your code. So imagine that your application can be dropping the request latency from one second to one quarter of a millisecond. That's what actually you can get when you move in all of the bootstrapping outside of your code. So Obviously, the free uh, cheese uh, is only in a mousetrap, and uh, there is the things which you have to be remembering when you're building diamondized applications because they keep being in the memory pretty much indefinitely. So, number one, memory leaks. Uh, scary thing, everyone is afraid of memory leaks. Well, just write code carefully. Don't use global variables. Don't store a, a user state somewhere in like static property, and they're going to be good. Plus, uh, there is a lot of instruments, including embedded, including instruments embedded to Roadrunner, which actually monitor your memory consumption and alert you about that. State pollution is a bit different problem, uh, much harder in some frameworks to debug. This is something when you essentially send one request and on a second request somehow you appear to be inside the user account of another user. This happens again when you just write a sloppy code, when for some reason you put the user authentication property in a static variable which is global for your whole application. Again, don't do that, use modern practices, use solid approaches and you're never going to meet this problem ever. 
Resource locking is another problem, uh, much rarely to occur, or when, when it actually does occur, you typically have significantly sized applications so you know how to handle it. This is where, uh, because you have a process which locks, uh, like which sits in memory indefinitely, imagine if this process acquires a lock for, uh, acquires a lock for the lock file. No one else will be able to write to this lock file. So make sure to use proper locks when you have shared resources or if you create database connections. Um, there is a thing about memory leaks because when we talk about long running approach and diamondized, the first thing which people talk to us, whoa, I mean, PHP has memory leaks. Uh, like we doomed, like you can't write applications like that. It's impossible because it's going to be memory leaks and you can't solve them. Well, I'll give you the example of languages which solve entirely the problem of memory leaks and there is no such languages. In every language in the market, Java, even Rust, Golang, and etc., you will be able to incur memory leaks. Uh, they are not language specific. PHP does not leak memory on a core level. It's purely in your code, it's purely in your head. Uh, in our practice, we do not write any we haven't created any like classic PHP applications for the last five years. We've seen memory leaks twice. Uh, and accidentally twice there was a monologue which was keeping the logs uh, copy in a memory. So that's kind of how it happens. If you use Symfony and Doctrine, it might be a bit trickier because Doctrine sometimes doesn't want to flush, but there is a ton of articles how to prevent this from happening. But again, typically if you have memory leaks, it should be something very obvious, something which is fairly easy to find using Xdebug, using any profile or tool and remove from your application. So if you overcome the kind of problem with memory leaks, so even if you haven't man, uh, met it, we've seen people just move into Roadrunner or like on Symfony and say, yeah, it just goes, just works out of the box. Uh, you are going to receive a major and substantial uh, benefit of using long running approach. And uh, it's not just performance, like performance is very cool. Yeah, your application could be like five times faster, but you're also immediately getting access to the number of instruments which uh, every other in every other person from any other language kind of already using uh, for their lifetime. You don't. Number one, you have memorization. Now you can initiate something, and while initiating, you can build them up, and you can keep it in variable, and that's it. You don't, you no longer need to have any caching files. Like you can just keep it directly in the memory, and you can actually forget about caching entirely. Like uh, who care about making a very complicated mechanism with invalidating translation cache when you can just keep it in memory and receive it within the nanoseconds? Your database connections and your service connections are persistent right now, which means that you no longer have to have this overhead of like TSL negotiation and etc. You're purely using the like persistent connections uh, as they've been advertised. Because your bootload phase now is free, you can now start doing crazy things, which we, for example, do in Spiral Framework, and you can build uh, aspect aspect oriented programming where you can tag different methods and different services. Uh, and then on a bootload phase, you can collect them, you can build them up, how to evaluate them, modify requests, like enable interceptors. Like you're basically opening a whole range of additional engineering patterns, which which previously you've been able to use, but they've been coming with additional overhead and additional cash and cost. Uh, so that's a lot of benefits. And last one, which is kind of funny, you now will be able to talk to engineers from other languages. Try to explain the Java engineer that you have to recreate Java application for every request. They, they'll be very confused for a long time. Now we don't have to do that. So how you can actually implement this model practically? Uh, typically, there is two approaches. Uh, approach number one, which is non-blocking approach. Welcome to the world of Node.js, Golang, and etc. Uh, in this approach, uh, everything looks kind of similar to what we described. You move your entry point inside an application. The only difference is that inside this entry point, you run multiple core routines, uh, uh, which handle multiple requests at once. Uh, this is going to be by by the fact the fastest way how we can handle a bunch of a bunch of requests because all of the requests share the same 
same process space, the same memory space, which means there is no overhead uh, or no extra memory costs. Uh, the downside specifically for PHP is that PHP has not been created supporting multiple coroutines. Yes, we have fibers now, we have uh, a bunch of tools like, well, React PHP, MPHP, Svulia, and etc. Uh, these tools, uh, they do solve this for you, but you kind of still still have to be careful about which type of database drivers you use, uh, which type of file operations you use, and etc. Like down to the point that you can no longer use sleep inside your code. And if you use sleep in your code, you're already doomed, but in this regard, it's even harder. Uh, so these tools are built to give you more or less concurrent approach building PHP applications. Uh, Swulio kind of stands alone, uh, stands uh, on the side a bit because uh, it doing that on a PHP core level as extension. It's very very fast. Uh, it provides you HTTP abstractions uh, and so on and so on. So uh, cool instrument, but it also does modify PHP code by itself, so it's more like a library rather than like a framework and etc. And speaking of, like, if you're using Svuli, you actually can use Svuli under the Roadrunner. It is perfectly fine to run Svuli coroutines inside uh, Roadrunner process. No one is stopping you from doing that. The second approach is a bit more classical and down to the PHP realities, and this is a PHP, uh, this is a blocking approach. In this case, instead of running multiple requests inside a single process, we spin up multiple processes. This is pretty much uh, like the same thing as PHP FPM does. The difference is that now the entry, pro entry point of the process located inside your PHP code, not uh, as in the environment. So you are getting the benefits of performance. You are getting like all of the benefits of long running application, but you're also getting the benefits that you're now able to use just your code. Like you can use blocking libraries, monologue, doctrine, I don't know, every existing PHP extension from the market. They are going to work. Maybe some very, very old extensions might leak memory, but from our experience, and we've been running a bunch of things like Protobuf and gRPC, none of them uh, experienced any leaks over a very long uh, period of time. So, what are we going to be doing today? We're going to be looking to the blocking approach because it's a less invasive, it's uh, given the most of the benefits with less modifications. So let's try to create an application server. And to do that, let's try to think what actually has to be done to create an application server. So number one, um, we want to make an, make an application server which is very like not super invasive and can work with pretty much every PHP framework on the market modern PHP framework on the market because we need framework which has this abstraction of request response. We do want to have the separation between PHP and the application uh, server itself. Like in case of Svulia, you kind of work inside a kind of single process. There is a ways to bypass it, but if pr something crashes, there is a chance that the whole process crashes. If your React application, cra React PHP application crashes, you're done. Like you have to restart the whole server. So in our case, we want to make sure that if PHP script dies for some reason, we can keep working and we can keep uh, running the payloads. We also want to have ability to make hot deployments, uh, debug modes, and etc. We obviously want to make sure that the server is fast and scalable. And uh, we want to make sure, at least from our perspective, that we can use it to not just for HTTP purposes. I mean, Making HTTP PHP fast is quite cool, but there is so much more in the market, which uh, we'll be telling you about uh, in this presentation, which PHP haven't touched for years. So we want to make sure that we can use PHP as kind of like universal powerhouse um, for your business logic. It also has to work everywhere, Linux, Windows, ARM computers, Raspberry Pis, I mean, you name it. And we want to make sure that we can extend it with very little overhead and build a number of plugins. And as you can see by now, we decided using Golang for uh, build an application like that. And as a result, we created Roadrunner. So let's dive in how we actually did that. So now we now we jump in a bit more to the uh, internals. So if you want to create an application server, uh, or if you want to understand how Roadrunner works, you have to understand few main building blocks. Uh, the first building block is uh, how you actually have the communication between PHP and Golang. 
and this is quite complicated because that's your most hottest part. That's where you're going to be pumping most of the data and you have to make it fast. You have to build some way to orchestrate and manage uh, the PHP processes themselves. Make sure they don't die or if they die, you can replace them. You also have to build the abstraction which allows you to send the requests to these workers in a very, very effective manner, but also guarantee that no worker will receive more than single request at once. So essentially they work in a blocking mode and you still can use your old fashioned code inside. You then have to build uh, old fashioned boring HTTP layer, that's simple. And you also have to have the plugin model, which allows you to extend this whole thing to the left and to the right. So to start, let's look at IPC or inter-process communication. And here you have multiple options. Uh, option number one, uh, this is option of doing the embedding. It is possible to use CGO, uh, use, uh, well, I forgot what else, but mostly CGO to basically embed PHP interpreter inside the Golan code. People done it. I think Franklin PHP uh, done it too. We looked at this approach looks promising it also looks very over engineered and very complicated because uh, the memory management modes inside golan and inside c uh, c++ with php use are very different so you kind of have to marry them together second approach is to use shared memory so shared memory is ability to well share memory surprisingly you can have the same data block which available with no overhead between php and golang uh, and the only thing you need to do is some way to synchronize that exchange so you need some kind of os semaphore uh, we haven't used any of these approaches yet but we actually do use uh, shared memory in a like very very newest version of roadrunner uh, but we use much simpler approach uh, which we decided to keep well, keys. And this approach is making a transport level protocol. So transport level protocol is essentially the ability to send bytes in and out in a full duplex mode over something. And in our case, uh, it could be TCP sockets, it can be Unix sockets, or the fastest way is using pipes. So every process you have, have a pipe, and this is a very, very fast pipe. You can push gigabytes of data to it, and it's going to be quite fast. So we build a protocol which allows us to essentially exchange payloads between PHP and Golang in both directions, and we build the rest at top of this protocol. So how we implement on that? Well, very simple. Uh, we use Protobuf as serialization protocol. Yeah, actually, in a more in some older plugins or older versions, we use JSON for that. Uh, in some other parts, we use just native packing, like uh, PHP pack function. Uh, but right now, we're pretty much sticking to Protobuf. Uh, and to implement that, you don't need anything. You just need to use uh, standard libraries, I/O uh, and NAT for Golang, and streams and sockets for PHP. No magic required, no extensions required. All of this code comes out of the box. So once we implemented Gorich, we also had an interesting side effect because we also implemented the, the Golang RPC protocols, and that allowed us to immediately start playing by making the Golang functions and then invoking these functions from PHP. So this looks like a little funny thing, but this little funny thing actually opens a lot of the interesting approaches which we're going to talk down the road. And we already seen a lot of users just using this portion of our code. Like uh, specifically, there is one uh, probably largest uh, forums in Belarus uh, who is using this approach and they're using it quite fun because on a forum, you have to parse DB codes and you have to format them to HTML. So what they found out that using the native PHP libraries or even using PHP extension libraries is slower than using Golink library for DB codes and communicating with that over the Gorich, surprisingly. And they had like a few times improvements on the latency uh, on their forms. So that's one. That's about IPC and communication. Uh, then we're talking about the processes. So if you want to manage the process of something, and specifically PHP, it's not that simple. Uh, you actually have to manage a lot. You have to manage uh, all the connection to pipes. You have to manage, uh, make sure that if process dies, you immediately notify it about that. You can't have zombie processes. You want to have some statistics about how long this process exists, how many tasks it handled, uh, and you also want to collect information from SD air pipeline so you can show uh, if there are any errors happens inside it so that's 
just an overhead which you have to use uh, to manage a single process. If you want to manage number of processes, you also have to create a process factory or worker factory. In this case, what we're also doing is uh, you have the way to initiate new processes. So you essentially create a new PHP process scripts um, and then you connect into them. So connection is differs based on the communication method. If you're using pipes, it's very straightforward create and use. Uh, if you're using sockets or shared memory or TCP, it's a bit different because you also have to make sure that when process launch, it connects back to you and you're doing the handshake. But overall, that's just how it works. You just spawn the process and you connect to that. Once you have a worker factory and the worker uh, kind of number of workers, you can create a worker pool. Well, here it's called load balancer, but internally we call it worker pool. Uh, and the worker pool is essentially the piece of code or like multiple pieces of code stitched together. Actually, a lot of the pieces of code touch together, uh, which manages the lifetime of your worker. So specifically, when request comes to the worker pool, what it does, it finds first available worker using leaf or stack. Um, it allocates this worker for this particular request and gives the payload to this worker to be executed. Remember, we have to make sure that uh, we can only use single uh, single request for the single worker. And we also have to make sure that we respect all the timeouts, that if all the workers overloaded, we can queue the request. So like if you have 50 workers and 500 requests per second, well, you have to queue them internally. Uh, once worker execution is done, you essentially return it back to the worker pool and it's available for the next execution. And the response from the worker comes back uh, to the user. Uh, if worker fails, uh, well, you have to recreate it. So you give the error back to the user and you create a new worker replacement inside the load balancer pool. So uh, this allows you to essentially keep cranking the data in non-stop fashion. So we created such approach, um, which essentially introduces automatic recovery. It makes sure that your worker works in a blocking mode. And uh, I think in our, at this older task, we ensure that we can allocate work within 120 nanoseconds. I'm pretty sure Valeria already cut it down in half by this moment, but this is uh, very, very fast if you want to crank a lot of the numbers. In addition to that, we also implemented uh, the subsystem in Sandy's pool, which is implements proactive worker monitoring. And this manages a lot of the worker stats and like health. It will watch how long time worker takes to process request. It will watch how uh, much memory worker consumes or when it was created. So if you have some older application in Symfony or Laravel, which for some reason leaks memory and you just can't find it or you don't have time to do that, well, you can just slap it uh, with uh, attribute maximum 100 megabytes per process and forget about it. Once Roadrunner will see that the process reaches a threshold, it will make a graceful replacement. So no request will be lost, it will be just gracefully replaced. In the Spiral framework, we don't have memory leaks by design, so we don't even use this type of supervision. But it's kind of quite useful for all the applications. Well, then you have to implement HTTP stack. And as you can see, it's super complex thing, which, well, actually not. It's just get request, map it, send to process, and get response. Uh, so it's actually very, very straightforward. Uh, and to implement that, we use pretty much just standard libraries from uh, from Golang, just HTTP library. And from PHP, we used the PSR 7 and 15 and 17, all of these libraries to basically uh, create and manage requests. This is quite cool because uh, these libraries are framework agnostic, so you can use them in pretty much any framework. They provide immutable um, approach, which is very suitable for long running applications. And you also have a ton of extensions, routers, middlewares available out of the box. So we tried not to reinvent the wheel. When you write your PHP code, well, what you have to do is to create this uh, main loop, which we spoke earlier. And this main look, uh, loop looks like that. Um, you just It's an infinite loop. You can always exit from that based on the request from the worker, but uh, you don't need to worry about this part. So what you do, you just wait for, you wait for requests from the user. Uh, once request comes, you generate the response, like typically the response is going to be between these two try-catch statements, and then you map the response back 
uh, to the worker. That's it. Like uh, you can literally write the script, put hello world, and it's going to be very, very fast, like hundreds of thousands of requests per second worker out of the box in PHP. Now you can just slap some frameworks at top or, or out in libraries, and here we go. You have your own uh, very fast framework. If you want to launch it, well, you just need to have a binary file or you want to build it by yourself. Uh, and then in this binary file, you basically just say what you want to launch. So uh, it's it's not the whole file. It's going to be a few additional lines. Uh, there is documentation about which lines are important, but that's pretty much it. You're just saying you want to have HTTP on such and such port and such and such amount of workers, and that's the command which contains your worker. And here we go. Just by doing that, uh, if your application and framework is ready, you can speed it up in a couple of times and get access to a number of interesting approaches. So what are these approaches we are talking about? What are these advanced patterns and usages? Like, Because I think uh, we all know that there is no life outside of the web HTTP stack. Now, no one is doing besides that. Well, let's take a look. So. If you will try to represent Roadrunner and its internal pipeline uh, in a modular fashion, you will see there is a number of extension points uh, which you can use or actually will use for you and provide plugins for you out of the box. So, first of all, uh, you can create middlewares in Golang. Uh, why do you need to do that? Well, if your application experiences high peak of loads, there is a lot of things which you might want to do even before the request reaches to your application, like rate limiting, like authentication, circuit breaker, and etc. Doing this code in PHP is possible, but doing this code in Golang is much more fun and much more scalable. So uh, you can put a middleware, and here we go. Your application now handle and mitigate API throttling request. You can also implement the middleware or observer, which is going to be collecting a bunch of statistics about your request, successful, failed, or not, and put them, let's say, to Prometheus. And for example, using this RPC bus or like Gorge, you can also push custom metrics to, to the Prometheus as well. So you can do that, but you don't have to because we have Prometheus embedded to the Roadrunner for the last three years, I would say, and all of the plugins uh, publish a lot of their statistics about memory usage, successful requests, uh, and so on and so on and so on. Um, and you obviously can declare your own custom metrics in a single line um, in your PHP code. Similarly, you can use uh, more complex solutions. You can collect uh, logging solutions, which, for example, going to be capturing all the HTTP requests, custom log from the application. Uh, and, for example, you can use uh, gray log or, I don't know, Datadog or something else to aggregate that. And you have a bunch of connections for that down on Golang side. And you can push these metrics and this information to the server in a background mode. So your request won't be having any overhead. You, for example, can be using Active Prof and send a bunch of metrics uh, or traces uh, to the vis visualization solution like Blackfire or Bug Regarder, which is actually a free alternative to the Blackfire. Uh, or if you build in something more complex like microservices application, you can have Autel Bridge, Open Telemetry Bridge, which will build the full traces uh, between your application pieces. So if one service calls other service, which spawns the job, which calls another service, you will be able to visual, uh, visualize it fully. We, by the way, have all of the things which I listed here embedded to the Roadrunner uh, in current version. You can go in a bit sideways. We don't do that. We don't recommend it. But for some for some people who really really want, uh, you can handle some of the requests on a Golang site and push the rest to the PHP. So like similar to Nginx, like you can have your own ingress layer. Uh, example out of the box static server. So like if someone wants a file, there is no need to pass it through PHP. We will do it on Golang end. Uh, if you're doing something more than that, you probably want to have a separate microservice. Uh, you can also have the full control of the PHP environment. So, for example, you can have additional control plane like ECTD or console. Uh, I, I forgot there's many of them. Uh, and you can use this one to control a whole deployments, change environments in runtime, and Roadrunner is going to be automatically controlling all of these pools uh, for you and all of the environment for you. So, like, your keys don't need to be in .n file. You can keep them separately. Uh, 
because you have RPC servers and you have plugin model, you can also embed um, Golang libraries to PHP. So like a while back, we actually had all of our documentation search working to the full search engine embedded to the Roadrunner server. We no longer do that. I think we use a Golia, but uh, most of the plugins we use these days kind of implement this pattern. You find a very nice Golang library for BB codes or PDF generation for God knows what, and you build an RPC layer for this library. And from this moment, you can start uh, calling it from your PHP code. So uh, as you guys notice, uh, till this moment, uh, we still have been in this web stack, HTTP stack. You have HTTP request, you, you handle that web socket, sorry, um, uh, middlewares and so on. So because we have Roadrunner and because we have this abstraction, we can now go much deeper and we can do much funnier things. So for example, we can remove HTTP stack entirely and we can replace it with gRPC stack. So same worker pool, same approach, a bit different type of payloads. So what we did, we actually created, I think, the first ever uh, uh, gRPC server for PHP. You can use it everywhere. It's framework agnostic. Um, and this service allows you to, well, do what it says, just run the gRPC server on Golang. Uh, and it's very, very fast server. So like, uh, imagine that you can have a microservice which is able to pull the data from database with validation and mapping and return it back in protobuf to other servers within a different language within, let's say, one-tenth of the millisecond. So that's the timings which we have been observing because it's it has much less overhead than HTTP stack. So very great instrument for the microservices. We can go in a much more interesting direction. And if you guys remember how you typically consume data from the car, from let's say uh, IMQP, well, you're going to use some something like Symphony Messenger, then you're going to create a consumer, then you're probably going to have some kind of supervisor for this consumer, and then you're going to have a cron tab, which is going to be pinging this consumer if something dies. Well, no more. Imagine that your PHP worker can simply ex uh, simply receive the payload to execute and give the response, and it doesn't need to be care about anything else. Uh, so that's what we did in uh, queue server or job server. This is probably one of the most complex plugins we have. Well, besides the next one I'm going to be talking about. And this plugin allows you to consume uh, very, very effectively uh, data from a number of brokers. You can use SQS, you can use NUTS, uh, RabbitMQ, uh, what else? Kafka, obviously. Uh, you can run uh, your jobs in, core, in Go routines in Golang, or you can use a local server which doesn't require any broker but provides you persistent queue. The beautiful part about this whole thing is that it's all broker agnostic, so your code doesn't care if it consumes from Kafka or from AMQP. You can write your application uh, on your local machine using Go routines and then you switch it to Rabbit and Queue and it just it will just work. So this abstraction allows us to also push uh, uh, Roadrunner to the limit because because we're able to do the consumption on Golang side, we can use multiplexing, we can use like multiple uh, connections and multi-threaded connections and so on. And as a result, I mean, it's quite easy to consume, let's say, 100 thousands of payloads from RabbitMQ in a second. So that's type of timings we're talking here. If, for some reason, you guys build in something way more complex than just uh, queues, uh, you're talking about sagas, you're talking about distributed transactions, or the flows where, for some reason, you have to make sure that no data can ever be lost, let's say financial flows, and, or e-commerce flows, or monitoring flows, we also have an integration with a very wonderful instrument which calls Temporal.io. And Temporal.io is an instrument for um, very complex orchestration mechanisms of very complex processes, let's say, or distributed processes. So imagine that from PHP perspective, you can define uh, just your service classes, just methods inside some interface or some code. You add an attribute for them, activity interface, and immediately you can start invoking this class from any other parts of your system, from Java, Golang, Python, Ruby, uh, Node.js, and it's all interpreted. You also can invoke the code from other services as well. It's fully covered with error logging. You can use any library inside these methods. You can go to database, you can write a file, you can do whatever you want. But the beautiful part is that you can now invoke this whole code in a thing which is called workflow. And this workflow is something which is quite fun. So as you can see on my screen, it looks like 
um, kind of async PHP, and because it is async PHP, you're able to invoke some of the methods from your PHP code, and they can be run from a different machine, even different data center or different language. You can invoke them from the workflow, uh, and you can do that in many different fashions. You can invoke multiple activities, or like the service code in parallel. You can invoke them inside coroutine. You can invoke for the activity in wait, like in this particular example. Um, and the workflow code, essentially, what it does, it guarantees you that the invocation will always always happen. And what do you mean always happen? Like what? We just invoke, say hi, and we pull the plug from the computer and call it a day. Well, that's a beautiful part. The temporal and why the temporal is used by pretty much every top 500 or maybe top 100 fortune companies is that they provide uh, the state recovery mechanism, which is transparent for you. You don't need to serialize anything. You don't need to go to database. What will happen is, is if your code will fail at this line and if it will restart your machine, reboot your worker, it will continue from exactly this line. It will do the state recovery using the uh, like aggregated history. It will guarantee that that code will complete execution and it will complete in a correct order. So if you're doing something, uh, whichever, like someone been saying, hey, let's use Sagas for that, don't use Sagas for that, use Temporal for that. This, uh, we actually do implement Sagas in Temporal and, and it's, a, it's a helper which contains 100 lines of code. So um, wonderful instrument when you're doing something very complex. There's a lot of plugins which I haven't spoke about, uh, too many probably. Uh, well, we provide you layers for the caching, so you can work with memcache, redis, uh, I mean, what else? A memory caching, bold db caching, uh, probably a few other drivers. Uh, they all provide a PS06 uh, 16, I think, uh, compatible interface, so you can just plug and play them to your code. In some cases, if you don't want, if you don't want to use Reddit, just keep it in memory. Like uh, this cache is going to be shared across all of your workers, and will operate as just like, a common cache for your application. We have a TCP server. Why do you need that? Well, uh, I didn't know why we did. Why do we actually need that until one guy built um, SMTP emulator on PHP? So now we can actually have a server which you can receive emails from a local machine and is going to play a role of basically the mail trap. Uh, you could have uh, web sockets, which we actively use. The Dynamo is a centrifuge, and we provide the bidirectional connection. So this means that you're not only able to send very, very effectively data to the centrifuge, you can actually receive it too. You will receive every event about connection, authentication of this connection, or when someone types in a web socket. So you have full control over the web sockets, and you can build chats or real-time games, et cetera, just out of the box. HTTP caching layer, obviously, I mean, nothing fun. Uh, there's a lot of logging layers. Uh, you can store a log from applications, some plugins. You can send them somewhere. You can send them in a file. You can rotate them. Anything you guys want to do. Open Telemetry is a very interesting plugin for the large applications. If you build something which contains more than a single microservice, you will find a use for Open Telemetry. They allows you to very easily trace requests um, between them. The last uh, plugin, which Valeri actually hated for a long time until he realized people actually use it everywhere is external service supervision so because we you have your own application server you actually can run uh, application inside the server similar to workers but with approach similar to system D so you can create let's say um, you can literally supervise uh, MySQL database inside the docker container of a PHP application don't do that that's crazy but People, for example, have been running centrifuge under the uh, Roadrunner, and you have a single entry point, and then Roadrunner doing the rest. You can actually, uh, from all of the services I described here, just a little note, you can actually configure them from PHP in runtime. So you can literally have, let's say, a CMS application in which, in a single click of mouse, you can install the supervised like Python script, which is doing some ML conversion under the hood. So you can build crazy things by using these things. Uh, how we build all the things? Well, uh, as you can see, we have a ton of the things in Roadrunner, but by its core, Roadrunner is a very, very simple thing. It's essentially the dependency injection 
kind of container for running a sync uh, services. Yeah, that doesn't sound that simple. But anyway, that's that's a core of Roadrunner, and this core can be built using the system we provided, which is called Velux. Uh, this system pretty much allows you to just say, I want this and this and this plugins and this custom plugin from a private repository, build me Roadrunner, and it's going to build your Roadrunner. So you can basically compose your application server as a framework from many different pieces, enable pieces you want, disable pieces you don't want, uh, and so on and so on and so on. So that's kind of tool we have uh, till this moment, and there is few next steps which we want to take uh, to improve it. So step number one is we want to take uh, a little bit kind of pivot in to the more classic direction, and we want to provide the ability to run legacy code via SAPI for under Roadrunner. So imagine that you can have a you can have a WordPress instance which for some reason uses Temporal and Kafka. Well. I don't know who needs that, but it will be possible to do. And the SAPI support, it will be Linux only, but it will allow us to run any legacy application under the road or in combination with any other plugin. Uh, the second thing, which uh, you guys will definitely notice, but again, it's only Linux only, we want to introduce the controllable forking point into the PHP processes. So one of the weaknesses, well, kind of weakness in Roadrunner is that uh, every PHP process inside the worker pools, uh, right now they are independent, which means they will consume a little bit more memory than they should because each of the process will include PHP interpreters like code, uh, kind of separately. If you will introduce a forking point based on our tests, we will be able to reduce memory consumptions in 300%. So imagine that if previously on a one gigabyte machine, you've been able to run 32 workers, you will be able to run 80 workers on this machine and you're going to rock. Well, so that's going to be in the future, but what we have now and what we basically implemented. We implement the system which now allows us to have a very good distinct uh, separation between concepts when you write our application. We have an infrastructure layer which contains of all of the heavy lifting, all of the con like consuming, queuing, managing, supervision. We're doing it all in Golang. It's a beautiful language for this task. It has co uh, goroutines, a ton of libraries, and it's it's very fun to create uh type of functionality in here. Uh, on PHP and uh, we actually removed a lot of the things because we no longer care about this infrastructure logic. We no longer need to write drivers for Kafka or RabbitMQ in PHP. And what we do, we write a pure, um, well, business logic code. So it's controllers, your APIs, some HTML generation, ORMs, and etc. So you kind of have this pair married together when one is doing heavy lifting, very, very fast responses, supervision, and another one is doing purely uh, business logic execution. We've been using Roadrunner on production since 2019. So yeah, it's it's four years right now. Uh, we initially created uh, it for one of the very heavy loaded applications we had, and we immediately seen uh, the four times lower latency. We completely eliminated five or two errors when FPM was overloaded, and our record keeping workers uptime, that's an old screen, eight months, not four months. So essentially, imagine you have a worker which just sits in memory for eight months, process a couple million requests by this moment, and well, it's still ready to process a few couple millions more. Uh, you can use effectively Keep Alive, uh, and it's very, very easy to integrate uh, with Docker because we also provide a ton of health checks and ton of Kubernetes integrations for the container. So you no longer have to question yourself, hmm, where do I put an Nginx and where do I put a PHP FPM together or separately? Don't care about that, just put Roadrunner and forget about uh, this pair altogether. Uh, the downside, which I don't think is a downside, you have to write a bit more like quality code. You're like You can't be sloppy and keep global variables. Uh, if someone will say it's a downside, I will disagree. I think it's a beautiful thing that you now have to create code which resembles uh, like more strict languages by each nature. How fast it works? Well, you've seen the previous screen. We have sub-millisecond responses. Uh, there is a ton of benchmarks on the market, but uh, so PHP FPM is this orange one, and the Roadrunner one is like this little, little blue one. So this is like, I think, synthetic uh, payload, but we are talking about, in this particular example, I think 
I don't know what we're even talking about because by, by this screen we're talking about 300 times faster which uh, practically is not realistic but on practice you might expect 10 times 20 times faster uh, execution on some endpoints and much faster execution if you're doing some optimizations uh, the roadrunner was released initially in 2018 and since this moment we have a steady growth we now approach in seven thousand downloads per day uh two and a half million no, two and three million uh, downloads till this moment. Uh, we have a very wide adoption, I think. There is a bunch of community and official integrations. Uh, Laravel, Symfony, UE, Slim, CakePHP, all of them have Roadrunner Bridge. Uh, in Laravel, uh, they put Roadrunner on the Octane, so you can use it there. However, they use only HTTP portion of that, so, um, well, still fast, good. If you really want to push Roadrunner to the limit, and if you really want to play with all the features which we advertised, or not advertised, described in here, let's say, from gRPC to temporal to memorization and uh, like aspect-oriented programming and etc., take a look at Spiral Framework. Uh, it's a fun thing. Uh, Roadrunner was created for Spiral Framework, not framework for Roadrunner, but that's that's how <laughs> how the tables turn let's say so this framework is highly optimized for the long running approach it's purely built to keep in memory indefinitely we have a lot of abstractions for that our bootload phase is clearly separated we're using uh, interceptors to like um, abstracted domain code and create a very very complex flows we have uh, dependency injection container with memory scopes included to prevent memory leaks and state pollution so like we try to introduce here all of the concepts which you can find in like .NET applications or Java applications, but we try to make them very friendly for your use. This is PSR friendly framework. It supports, I mean, I think almost every PSR format from seven to 16, like uh, it just, we just don't see much point like inventing our own wheel. Um, it, as we say, it supports every feature from Roadrunner, uh, from WebSockets to Temporal to gRPC to queues. Uh, um, it also comes with Orium, which not, actually not used just by us as a cycle Orium. Uh, cycle Orium is an Orium which is an alternative for the doctrine, but it's much lighter and it's again built for the long running applications. Next, it also has a few very interesting features like the support for data modeling. So if you're ever going to be creating CRM, CMS, ERP applications or clone of the Drupal, let's say, uh, Cycle ORM can sell, save you half of the year of the implementation. Uh, there is a few other ecosystem instruments. Bug Regatter, uh, we haven't really officially released it yet, but you can Google it and find it. It's uh, essentially a local alternative for Blackfire IO. You create a Docker container, and now you can visualize all of these nice looking traces and like a build a call graph and call tree and flame charts for for your code. So if you don't want to play, pay for Blackfire, uh, well, don't pay for bug recovery. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a free instrument. So why do you need Roadrunner? Uh, if you still don't know why do you need Roadrunner, uh, run faster PHP code, make much lighter Docker containers, uh, get access to the instruments which have been unavailable for PHP for a while, uh, and get access to the whole ecosystem of Golang tools to enhance your application. So if you're building something super crazy, Roadrunner is going to be an instant tool because it allows you to connect very interesting pieces together in a very um, easy fashion. That's our link. You can take a look at that. And there is some links for the additional resources. Thank you for your attention. If anyone have any questions, please let me know. It's only, it's only me clapping you, Anton, <laughs> uh, at the moment. Okay, so uh, we have one question here. Um, is there any known disadvantage using Roadrunner, for instance, those were discovered after Roadrunner Foundation? Is there any issues using Roadrunner for those discoveries? Disadvantages. Again? Uh, is there um, any known disadvantage using Roadrunner? So since it was like released, I mean, yes, uh, the, dis in the, PHP. The, disadva the disadvantage of using Roadrunner, if you have a super sloppy old code, you will take a lot of time adapting for that. If you use modern framework versions like uh, Fresh Symphony, it's going to be much easier to use. Besides that, uh, like 
yes, you might have memory leaks. Yes, you'll have to think about your code being in memory permanently. It's a very complicated process. It took us a whole week to onboard middle-level engineer to use it. So it looks complicated and scary. Once you practice, it's, it's very easy. So practically, I'm seeing very little disadvantages besides ones that very old applications might not work here out of the box. And that's why we build a SAPI bridge. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I personally, I do like this slowly showing gopher uh, in, in, in the whole presentation. <laughs> this is super funny, fu funny thing, you know. <laughs> so I'm just curious why, so I, since I'm not um, such involved in, in the PHP uh, itself, uh, I'm, I'm just curious why uh, Octan and Symfony uh, implement only HTTP layer. So it's so complicated to implement other parts of the Rodan because, you know, everyone knows Octan, for example, and a uh, very little portion of these people know about uh, that uh, the only one single plugin used in th inside the Octan or um, Symfony runtime, for example. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm the wrong person to ask it. Like, uh... For some reason, uh, HTTP is still considered like uh, like numero uno for PHP. Like you just run it in the web. But honestly, like if you guys take a look on a queue provider, you will never ever write uh, your own consumer code uh, in PHP. It just doesn't make sense. It's going to be slower, more flunky, more clunky. It will be dying much more often. It's going to be um, like you won't be able to switch drivers that easily. So like. We specifically write these plugins to make PHP programming easier. I don't know. Maybe they just don't look um, like PHP outside of these boundaries. Or maybe they just already built so much infrastructure and so much kind of ecosystem in, uh, like around existing instruments uh, that uh, they don't, it's just hard for them to integrate. I mean, Laravel and Symfony are old frameworks. They have a lot of legacy components. They have a lot of legacy approaches like... Uh, moving uh, some significant parts of them under the Roadrunner, yes, it will be faster, yes, it will become more flexible, but you still have to move them. But I mean, I, I, th I think there, yeah, the, there, are, there are community bundles for Symfony running Symfony under gRPC, so people doing that. There are community bundles, I think, running uh, Q consumption under the Symfony too. So I'm not sure about Laravel. I think there is, uh, I think in our plugin, we can consume jobs. But mostly in Laravel, you talk about HTTP. Like, unfortunately, extending Laravel architecture on core level is a bit more complicated. That, uh, yeah, but it might be. Yeah. So it's it it was very interesting uh, to me because yeah, you know, I'm not so involved in all of these PHP uh, movements, all of these PHP things and i'm just curious about well i mean the, the, the thing is like the, the history of spiral is quite fun because when we initially been i mean C spiral is 14 years old just so you guys know it's an, it's an it's an old framework as well but it's been proprietary for almost 70 years until we decided to make it open source but when we decided to make it open source we took a look at symphony and we said yeah i mean symphony looks like it's doing what spring like Java Spring doing, so let's make sure that framework can run in long running mode and consume data from multiple uh, like uh, dispatchers and multiple queue methods, and we build framework this way. And like three years later, we built Rodor to drive it to the limit. And then we realized that Symfony actually not built like <laughs> Spring Boot at all. It actually using completely different architecture, which using uh, events uh, under the hood and using different canals for them. So it it was inspired by Spring but uh, like it took them a few more years to actually create Symfony runtime and more or less handle this problem uh, of uh, memory leaks. I think the doctrine is still failing. So like we kind of got misled, yeah, yeah. but as a result, we got an instrument which was like for us to create a new consumer method. Like it, it's it takes a week like of pure time. Yes, planning, talking, etc. But it just it's it just an architecture. It's just an architecture. Yeah, we have a single core, and the single core can consume data from many different verticals. Yeah, uh, okay, another worker, I think it's most more or less for me. How are you spawning additional workers which are not HTTP, for example, for Centrifuge? Uh, for example, the Symfony bundle for her uses primary HTTP adapter, and I don't see any way to run two different workers' entry points. Uh, so if you are talking about 
internals of the Roadrunner. So this is basically we have a Golan grid in SDK. So Roadrunner itself, if you will see as a repository, run uh, Roadrunner, Roadrunner itself is pretty small code base. It's like one um, thousand lines of code, but uh, all of this kind of stuff. Yeah, so all of this kind of stuff shows uh, uh, by the SDK, which are actually allocating the workers, which is used by the server plugin. So uh, this, there are no difference between, um, you know, between the workers in Centrifuge plugin or HTTP plugin or Jobs plugin or et cetera. So they are just uh, processes I, 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 in terms I, I, of the road. Runner. I can talk from the PHP perspective. When we initiate the worker, we tell the worker what plugin it is going to be working on. In Spiral, we automatically select the right dispatcher for that. In your code, you might take a look at the um, uh, tutorials we have. The, the, you, you basically, take a look at the environment variable. It will tell you which plugin this yeah. worker, worker is intended for, and you can create a specific consumer for this plugin. And in our SDK, we, ha we should yeah, have yeah. consumers for different plugins. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, we, we provide, I forgot about this, uh, with every pool, we provide an information with uh, environment variables in what exactly plugin or subsystem of the Roadrunner runs this particular worker pool. So for example, for the HTTP, it would be uh, mode HTTP, for the centrifuge, it will be mode centrifuge and etc. So we can like, um, based on this um, um, environment variable, uh, you might like, you know, dispatch your code. Uh, so this is kind of, uh, for example, the Symphony bundle for her. Uh, Symphony bundle for Roadrunner, uh, are you talking about, um, I think, Baldinov, if I'm not mistaken about the name. Uh, so about this bundle. Because uh, official one, I think from Nyholm, if I'm not mistaken, second time. <laughs> so um, uses only um some kind of kernel reboot if i remember correctly so uh like this and i'm also curious about uh use cases for advantage uh i'm also curious about the one thing uh about the roadrunner so um i know that anthony should go in a few minutes but i i, I can't ask uh, i can't i should ask this question so uh why not to like Initially, why not to use some kind of existing framework? So why to use, uh, especially why why that was a decision to write an own framework instead of using, like for example, uh, existing Laravel or Symfony? If Symfony like uses some cool code patterns and good code like this. Well, if they're going to be using cool patterns, I'm sorry guys, but they won't be have memory leaks by this moment. That's that's the problem. <laughs> I, yeah, this is. <laughs> I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So... We've been creating a framework in time when the go-to framework was code igniter, guys. So uh, it wasn't that much choices. But we kept. We've been building like by this moment, three hundred different applications for three hundred domains. So we had to have very flexible framework. And at the time when Composer didn't exist, at the time when framework being downloaded by zip code, uh, sorry, by zip archive and et cetera, we just been keep building our uh, kind of pro- Hello, go past. Yeah, we've been building our things based uh, <laughs> on our experience and so on and so on and so on. Uh, and then, uh, yes, we really had a choice. Like uh, in 15, when we started releasing the Spiral first version, we realized, yeah, what we put in public uh, makes sense, but it's also outdated compared to what other people put in public by this time. So from one moment, we could just say, yeah, it's done and uh, we would never create Roadrunner. But from another perspective, we decided, okay, let's just have a framework which is built by our rules and can handle very complex payloads. Uh, and then we extended it to this point. So, yeah. Kind of interesting. Yeah. And, uh, also as well about cycle or RAM and, uh, so I uh, so this is completely new questions from the uh, from the man who are working on the Roadrunner but doesn't touch any PHP uh, part at all. So um, uh, do you have any intentions of the question from the chat? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try uh, to move on the call. See what I'm doing for you guys. Uh, 
<laughs> Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, and do you have any intention to implement Messenger, Symfony Messenger, like for Spiral Framework? Or maybe it could be substituted by any existing Spiral I, company. I mean, queues are this Messenger. I, I think I think someone been talking to implement that. I mean, uh, we don't use it, but making a breach for the Messenger, or in my personal opinion, based on what I've seen, is like two days work. Maximum. This includes reading documentation and trying to understand what you're doing. It's a very, it's a yeah. very light abstraction for passing messages. Just put a publisher underneath and put consumer at the top. And here we go. You have a symphony messenger running inside queues for the symphony or inside Spiral. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, sure. Yeah, and the I think last question you talked about RabbitMQ and other queue systems. So I'm I ah, so so it's not a question; it's like just a statement. You talked about RabbitMQ and other queue systems. So I'm interested in replacement of my Symphony console up by Sp Spiral. So good luck, go on. So I mean, we are, uh, we'll this, try to so help you. Just, just so you guys know, like the path of replacing Symphony with Spiral is probably the most common path we've seen at least in the, inside the community, mostly because these frameworks are very very similar. So the code which you write in Spiral, it's pretty much the same. Like you can have uh, you can have annotated roads. We use in Symfony console commands. Uh, like we use in different bootloader methodic, but like it's not like Laravel. You won't see you won't see facades. You won't see uh, active record. It's pretty much the same thing as you see in Symfony, just more polished in terms of long running applications. Uh, we created clear applications, we created ETL applications, applications with zero web endpoints. It's, it's a perfectly fine to just have a consumer's so applications with gRPC endpoints, with just uh, temporal workers. So uh, it's, it's fairly yeah. flexible. I mean, the biggest hurdle you're going to be, you're going to have, I think, is just moving uh, your ORM layer from uh, Doctrine to Cycle. But again, I, I'm going to show you, let's say, the, I'm going to show you, let's say, the, cycle code for example so i mean attributes same stuff even i can understand yeah, it. <laughs> same exactly stuff in fact you can even use uh collections from doctrine here you also can use laravel collections or just arrays uh for your style but uh that's pretty much it there is few differences in cycle ORM in Doctrine, and I think some of the differences are in favor to Doctrine, and some of the differences in very much favor of cycle ORM. Hmm, interesting. This is kind of interesting for me as well. So a lot of, uh, um, like, the PHP community consists of these three, uh, I mean, two no, big frameworks. Just, like... just so people won't call me active record. The interface is just a method. There is no active record. You don't extend any God objects. It's a pure PHP or ob plain objects. So, yeah. I think it's super cool. Yeah, uh, a lot of work was done to implement all of this. Um, so, I, and another statement: I disagree. Symphony and Spiral are very different. You cannot copy paste your systems from one to another. The migration is just big as creating a new project. I did uh, I, I didn't about all this I didn't say, symphony bundles. I, I didn't I didn't I well. didn't say it, it's copy paste. I say the similar architecturally on your controllers and the way how you use the services. You don't use facades, as I say it. You can call services from the DI. You can inject them properly. You can use IOP patterns. I'm actually not sure if Symfony has IOP patterns. Uh, and the OREM is a similar data mapper. So yes, it's not copy paste, but conceptually we have the similar parent, let's say, which is Spring Boot and ISP.NET applications. Yeah, and also as well, I see. I think uh, this is correct. So uh, migrating from any framework nowadays uh, in PHP ecosystem uh, is kind of uh, challenging part of your uh, rewriting. Ecos thing. Ecosystems yeah. are huge, of course. I mean, I yeah, you, because if, if, if you, you full on Symphony ecosystem and have hung with bundles, I'm seeing not much reason for you to migrate to Spiral. Yeah, so it's better for you to like. Uh, we have these concepts of plugins for the Rod Runner. So if you have uh, some kind of heavy application load or heavy uh, logic, you might just create a simple, very teeny middleware. We have a tutorials on our YouTube channel. So uh, you can create them and uh, like redirect some load of the from your application, existing application to the Rod Runner, and then like 
like block by block, step by step, re-implement every single part if you really needed to uh, like migrate from your existing ecosystem to Spiral. So, uh, yeah. Okay, guys. So I think Anthony is have to go to another call. Uh, thank you very much, Anthony, for the presentation one more time, and thank you very much for being with us. Uh, if anyone, I, I, think... I think the next thing we can ask, if, if anyone will be curious, just to hear about Spiral itself, because in fact we spoke about Cycle, we spoke about Temporal, we spoke about Roadrunner, we never ever actually yeah. spoke about the framework itself. So this could be an interesting uh, thing for the stream. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You can like. Um... Mm, one time so we can you can prepare some kind of uh, small talk about the framework because i can't do this uh, so i am um, i'm just a road run guy so yeah. <laughs> completely not a php <laughs> so we can uh, ask about we can tell about uh, people tell about how to migrate some kind of parts so how to write a plugin how to you know a lot of things we can um explore here with you okay so this is super cool. Yeah. Okay, guys. Thank, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, have a great day and see you on the next stream. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.